Regardless of where you grew up or where you've lived, you'd be hard-pressed to not find some measure of historical myth embedded in the culture of where you live. Great and fantastical stories have often served as the bedrock of many societies. Even the most modern and industrialized ones find their ideals, values, and strength in the stories of old. Herculean tales of heroism that defy logic, such as running into a burning building or lifting a car to save a crushed victim, remind us that these tales of old have relevance even by today's standards of living. It would seem as though it's ingrained in us, the need for a great story, and even more so, the need for a great hero to overcome a terrible villain. For not all circumstances that deal with heroism are defined by overcoming the odds. In fact, we tend to define our heroes by the villains they overcome. Which begs to ask the question, why do we even have heroes and villains? It's an inquiry that may sound strange, but seeing as how so many of us view the world as me versus something or someone, it's worth some effort to see how this all transpires in real time, where it started, who has spoken to this idea, and if this is something we always look to, no matter what place and time we find ourselves in. I'm J.C. Alfelto, and this is episode 77 of The Writer's Lens, Cain and Abel, and the Origins of Heroes and Villains. All right, everyone, welcome back to The Writer's Lens, the lighter side of the JCL Felto podcast endeavors. Uh, Welcome to 2021. And uh, as always, I like to do, I will remind you of the Narrative Wars, which is the darker side of the JCL Felto podcast endeavors. (laughs) You can hop over there and find me on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, where we talk about narratives and their power in uh, culture and society at large. Whereas here on The Writer's Lens, it's more about storytelling and how that applies and ultimately how we see things through the lens of a writer. So that all being said, uh, the writer's lens has been an enormously fun and life-giving podcast for me as a storyteller uh, over the years. Uh, I've had this podcast now for about three years or so, a little bit more than three years, and it's grown at times exponentially. Other times it's been kind of stagnant. Uh, And as I head into 2021, I'm making some what could be very difficult decisions about the future of this podcast because the focus may start shifting more to the narrative wars. I may have more frequency on the narrative wars. But uh, what I see happening a lot with the writer's lens is a desire to talk about many of the things that I do talk about on narrative wars for writer's lens and then vice versa. Uh, So if you're a fan of this podcast, bear with me. I'm still going to have content. I'm not saying I'm jumping ship or something like that. But... You may see some cross-pollination. You may see some things crossing over once in a while just because a lot of the themes and the analysis that I do of stories, such as with this episode, will have relevancy over at the Narrative Wars as well. So it's kind of cool, I guess, when I start talking about it out loud that that's sort of the direction I'm going at this point. Uh, But uh, for those that have been on the ride for just one podcast or the other, thanks for sticking with me. Thanks for uh, giving me feedback and... uh, most of it positive versus the negative, (laughs) or as I always say, I'm a glutton for punishment. Any feedback to me, I think is valuable, uh, because then at least it shows that people are listening or at least trying to listen. Uh, so all things considered, we're moving ahead. It's 2021. Let's keep rocking and rolling. And this episode on heroes and villains, I think is incredibly relevant and is one that probably could have its own series in and of itself. I know I say that about a lot of my episodes that you could probably do a whole series on heroes and villains, but we're going to do a little bit of an overview with this, uh, mostly because I just did a uh, an episode on the narrative wars talking about what does it look like when the good guys win? What is the narrative that emerges from there? Uh, so from a writer's standpoint, when we think about heroes and villains, this is a, this is an, um, I don't. I wanted to say obvious thing, but this is something that occurs frequently. Okay, most stories have a hero, and most stories have a villain. Uh, you can find that in most every single form of storytelling that there is. That if you're going to present a story, you have some sort of inciting incident. You have, uh, you know, the exposition, the building of the plot, the climax, the the, the come down or the denouement at the end of it. Uh, But somewhere caked in there is your protagonist and your antagonist, someone who's moving the plot forward and someone who's trying to forestall it and is coming against the hero or the protagonist, trying to keep them from achieving their goal. And the interesting thing is that if you really were to just look at it from a protagonist versus antagonist standpoint, your protagonist could actually be a a bad guy uh, or a villain. 
And your antagonist could be your hero character, which, again, in today's culture, is something we see happening quite a bit. There's been sort of this romanticizing of villains where we love to see things from the villain's standpoint rather than just the heroes, and we sympathize with the villains even. I mean, look at movies like Joker that came out with Joaquin Phoenix about a year or two ago. Uh, We saw The Suicide Squad, which was kind of an anti-hero group of individuals uh, sort of enacting justice. I never really saw the movie. I'm kind of familiar with the team, though. Uh, you know, stories like that, uh, that we see, uh, and even before that, uh, there was the very popular show, I think on, was it Showtime, with Dexter, who was the quote-unquote good serial killer, where he would choose victims that were uh, villains, basically, even though he himself was a monster, I mean, he killed people, uh, but that was often overshadowed by the idea that he was doing it for good. So again, this concept of heroes and villains in our postmodern uh, Western society has become a very, very difficult area to navigate because of all the differences of perspective now. So this episode is kind of a lead into that. Uh, there's three parts to this that I wanted to look at from, like I said, from a writer's perspective. First and foremost being, you know, what is a hero? What is a villain? Where did this come from? Second part being, you know, what is one of the first examples that we might find uh, in story when it comes to heroes and villains? And if you've already read the title of this episode and caught that in the beginning, and you probably already know where where I'm going to go with that. And then lastly, how does it all apply today? You know, how does this concept of heroes and villains apply today? All right. So that being said, what do you think of when you hear the word hero? What do you think of when you hear the word villain? What kind of thoughts, emotions come to mind when you hear either of these words? Now, for me personally, when I think of a hero, I often think of something bright or I think of something that uh, is without a lot of blemish, is someone who has struggled against something, overcomes it, uh, maybe has extraordinary talents or giftings, qualities, something of that nature that is outside just the norm of conformity. For villains, it's a little bit more varied, actually, for me when I think about villains, Um And some of that, I think, is a cultural thing uh, because, like I said, in American culture today, villains often are, I think, more multi-layered and deep than many of the heroes that we see in in stories. Uh, We've almost lost this uh, love affair with heroes, and we've replaced it with a love affair with villainy just to see what the villains are all about. And in, in some way, this could be the pendulum shift from the 1950s and 60s with the, uh, you know, everything has to be in its order. The world was post-World War II. There was this incredible desire to get back to a very orderly and predictable life, livelihood, to get away from the chaos that there was of World War II and just the incredible atrocities that were revealed post-World War II, such as the Holocaust and just the, you know, I think it was Unit um, uh, 731 in Japan uh, that was literally torturing POWs in ways that even the Holocaust uh, looked somewhat um, not even as bad as what was going on in those places. So this pendulum shift to villains and sort of sympathizing with them, when I think of a villain, uh, I, I sometimes get two different pictures. I get sort of a dark, almost black kind of like visage, you know, atmosphere, sort of an unpredictability that's both exciting but at the same time dangerous. And then there's also this concept of allurement. You know, there's a, there's almost like an attractive nature to a lot of villains. And I've talked about this in other episodes where villains tend to be attractive to people because they they do the things out loud, they say the things out loud that most of us wish we could do with no consequences. That's really what a villain is. A villain uh, tends to be a, a person who acts on selfish impulse and pursue something selfishly that will ultimately be for themselves. It's not really for the betterment of others. It's for the benefit of themselves for whatever reason. And that's attractive to people. Okay, that's definitely an attractive quality because a hero, in uh, in contrast, is a guardian or a protector. It actually comes from, I believe, the Greek, where heroes uh, are defined as being guardians and, and, like I said, protectors of something. So they're putting their bodies and their and themselves in the way of something that could potentially not just harm them, but somebody else or some other thing. Uh, they're like the last line of defense against something that means something bigger 
uh, than just themselves. And so heroes and doing heroic acts are very difficult to do. That's why they're heroes, because they have to put something else ahead of themselves. They have to negate and deny themselves in order to actually become a hero, whereas villains indulge themselves. They indulge their, their impulses. They indulge all of their desires uh, that usually revolve around themselves, and that's what makes for a great villain. I mean, just think of the most popular villain you know of, perhaps, um, and they would share this quality. Okay, Darth Vader, for instance, pursues something very selfishly. Uh, Voldemort, all right, um, you know, my wife and I just got finished watching the Hobbit trilogy, uh, which I probably should do an analysis on soon, but that's not, for, that's for another time, <laughs> but the, uh, the villains in those movies, you know, Azog the Defiler, if you're familiar with the story, or Sauron who shows up at some brief moments in there, selfish, you know, the characters are very selfish, they are there for their own glory, they're there to do something for themselves that is for their own glory, um, and don't get me wrong, some heroes end up becoming heroes even out of selfish desires. But at some point, they have to make a choice where sacrifice ends up becoming part of their tool belt of characteristics and traits, right? That's ultimately what is going to define the hero. So uh, heroes, as I said, they have strength, they have power, they have knowledge, they have abilities that are outside just the ordinary that other people might seem to lack. So they're exceptional, they're unique. And villains, by comparison, are a lot like them. They might also have extraordinary abilities and knowledge and power and resources and the ability to do something that an ordinary person would not. But as I said at the end of the day, they will ultimately act out in a selfish fashion. So for those of you out there writing good stories or wanting to write good stories, remember this. Your hero should be a sacrificial type of hero. That's, that's a great type of hero to follow. Uh, the anti-hero tends to be walking that, that line of, well, the anti-hero behaves out of his own self-interest, but in some way, shape, or form ends up helping the greater good of the storyline. Like Wolverine, I think, is a good example of an anti-hero. Um, the Punisher, perhaps, is an anti-hero. Uh, just thinking of sort of popular comic book characters that might fit in there quite easily. Uh, these folks tend to behave somewhat selfishly, but in the end, what they do helps sort of a greater good of things. Like more people are, uh, will be able to prosper and thrive and be without any kind of, um, you know, mal you know, uh, I almost said malfeasance coming towards them uh, so that they do not have to suffer in some way. Whereas any villain, any villain is going to help themselves. They're not going to be helping out the greater good. I mean, uh, again, going back to comic books, if you thought of the, the opening of The Dark Knight and how the Joker robs that bank, for those who have never seen The Dark Knight, I go watch it. Okay, go watch it. But the opening there, the Joker hires on these guys in masks. We never actually see their faces to help him rob a bank. And he instructs each one of them to kill the other guy after he succeeds in one part of the plot. So if uh, if, they're, if two guys were sent to get on top of a roof and then open up the, the door of the roof to get into the bank... Then as soon as they do that, one guy should shoot the other guy so that he can get in by himself and he doesn't have to have two people with him. And this just trickles on down until eventually it's just the Joker and the bus driver, of course, who comes in and, and takes him out of there. It's just him that's left after he kills this other uh, henchman. And then the Joker even says it, if you have seen this, he's like, I killed the bus driver. And the bus driver shows up and basically kills him and you know he goes off with all of his stolen money. So... Great opening with a lot of significance that just points to that exact point, that, that, that points to that exact theme, is that the villain is going to act out selfishly. So an example of this, so this is part two for those following along at home. The villains uh, throughout history that we can think of, you know, many villains, uh, you know, Greek mythology, for instance, uh, you know, villains such as uh, characters like the Hydra, Medusa, uh, that would tend to be villains, monstrous entities uh, that stand in the way of, of mortal men and women. Um, I'm going back even further. I'm going back to the story of Cain and Abel in the Bible. And you may hear this and go, well, wait a second. I thought the first example of heroes and villains was in the Garden of Eden, if you're going to use a biblical example. That Adam and Eve versus the you know the tempter, the snake, this was the first hero moment. Or first, the first villain was the tempter, was the snake who you know, poisoned the minds of, of Adam and Eve and had them eat of the, the fruit from the Garden of Eden. Look, that was a failure 
to be a hero, okay? Adam and Eve failed, which is, again, from my worldview perspective, the reason why we're even in this mess is because they, they screwed up and they took of the, the fruit and ate it. They failed to rise up to the moment. Um, they failed to rise up to the moment and stop themselves from doing this thing that was disobedient to God, which was don't eat from this tree. And, of course, uh, Satan came in and said, no, 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 you, you, you can do it, right? You can do it. So they were not heroes, okay? They were actually failures. The first instance that we might see, or one of the instances we might see very early on in the Bible of heroes and villains is the story of Cain and Abel, the brothers. And for those who may or may not know, Cain was trying to please God with an offering, and so was Abel, and Abel was also giving an offering to God. And what happened was, is Abel gave what was pleasing to God that God had asked for. Cain did not. Cain gave what he thought would be the proper offering. He didn't follow directions, okay? He was, he was disobedient. And in doing that, Abel was praised for what happened, um, and uh, Cain was not. Cain was disgraced, and out of his jealousy for what was given to Abel for this good and kind offering, Cain killed his own brother. He killed his own flesh and blood out of jealousy and rage, and uh, due to the fact that he was he felt something was taken from him that was deserving of his own. So this idea of heroes and villains often today gets lumped into you got to save the world, you got to save all the innocent people, you've got to save uh, you know this city from being destroyed by the giant bomb. We tend to, to take this idea of heroes and villains and we blow it up into this, this concept that if you don't act now, everybody's going to go. You know, you're going to lose everyone. I mean, the, uh, several, several movies now, Hollywood films, really play this up. Like, you got to save the world. Again, on a much more micro level, heroes and villains uh, making decisions at the micro level, whether I'm going to sacrifice something for a greater good in my own life, is heroic. You don't necessarily have to be the one that steps in front of a bomb to be a hero. You don't necessarily have to be someone that, uh, you know, stops the countdown from blowing up an entire continent or you you send the missile into the alien, you know, ship and you blow up all the aliens or something like that and you've saved the world. You know, this, this sort of Hollywood style of heroes and villains tends to be very attractive because it's like, look at all of this that I've done. I've, I've conquered the, the massive villain and everyone can be happy now. Everyone praise me, yada, yada. Well, actually, if you think about it, the hero is the obedient one. The hero is the one who does what is best, not just for himself, but for everyone else, and does what is obedient and pleasing to others in, in some sense. Like, they are the guardians, the protectors of others, and not, as well as themselves. And so Abel, who does what is asked of him, and does it well, and does what is good in God's eyes, and Cain, who does not feels slighted by all this and takes out his aggression not on God at all. He takes it out on his own brother and kills him. And this act of villainy, if you will, this acting out of a selfish desire, out of an impulse, is to me an example of heroes and villains. You have your hero who does something perhaps you know, through his knowledge and power and strength that is pleasing and good, Whereas the villain, by contrast, who does similar things, does it disobediently, okay? Doesn't follow the rules, doesn't, you know, and again, this isn't like stepping in line and, you know, being, conf you know, conforming to something. No, he, he does the wrong thing. He does what is not good. He does the opposite of that. And in doing so, he becomes enraged. He makes an impulsive decision. He kills his own brother over it, his own flesh and blood. And you see this idea playing out throughout history, throughout many other stories where people will literally kill one another out of jealousy, out of envy, out of a disobedience towards something, out of desiring something that someone else has. They're coveting something else that someone else has. Uh, you know, I, how many stories have we read in the news about uh, a love affair or, you know, a spouse that was set up by someone else? I mean, there was the big rumors on the internet a year or two ago uh, with Tiger King and uh, what's her face? The, the lady on there who supposedly fed her her late husband to the tigers. Okay, <laughs> I just can't think of her name right now, but you can probably you probably know who I'm talking about. But there was this whole idea that she did that, you know, out of some selfish desire that she fed him to the tigers, and you know, there's this ongoing debate whether or not she did. And and 
that would make that person a villain because they did something that was inherently for themselves and they hurt someone else in the process. And not only did they hurt someone, they murdered someone. And this is what Cain did to his own brother Abel. He murdered him out of jealousy, out of envy, out of all these things uh, that he desired to have done when all he had to do was basically follow the better example and he did not. And therefore he became a villain in the story. So how does this all apply today? Okay, now that we've gone kind of hashed that out, um, even through a bit of a tangent there. You know, what, how does all of this apply today as far as heroes and villains go? Now, Joseph Campbell's a guy I've referenced before on this podcast, and uh, he's a guy that uh, is very popular for many books about myth and exploring myth, the hero's journey. He was probably the first guy to really mainstream the concept of the hero trope. Uh, and I, I want to, he's not really the father of it because there were many before him that wrote on similar topics about how there's this archetype of, of myth and, and heroes overcoming obstacles and all these kinds of things. But Campbell was the guy that when you think, when you go back and look at history of publication, Campbell's name is probably the one that's going to come up the most. And Campbell cited that there were four functions of myth and for heroes uh, in general, that we should all follow, or that are all followed by certain religions and societies and all these things. And I want to read these real quick because this is how this all applies, this idea of heroes and villains uh, today. Uh, Campbell cited that uh, there's there's basically four functions of it. He says, one is to reconcile one to the mystery of the universe. Two, to render a cosmology for interpreting it. Three is to reinforce a moral order. And four is to unveil the psyche. Now, all of that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook, I'm sure. Okay, reconcile one to the mystery of the universe. That's basically about finding meaning and purpose. Why am I here? To render a cosmology for interpreting it. Okay, we all know that we're here for some purpose or meaning, uh, but what's the greater narrative of this? What's the macro narrative? Why are we all here? Let's, let's, let's interpret why things are happening the way they are through story. And then reinforcing a moral order. Okay, now that we've reinforced all of these elements of story, we have to have some sort of order behind them. There has to be something we aspire to. There has to be a, a, a horizon that we head off in the d direction of that is predictable in some way, but also gives us something to go towards, right? And then it's to unveil the psyche. Okay, so now that we've done all that, unveiling the psyche, what is it truly in the unconscious? What, what are we really after? Okay, we can define meaning and purpose through all of these things, through these bigger stories, through these acts of of heroism to these great tales of whatever they are, but really, what is it? What's at the very core of us, in our in our psychological needs and wants, that is there that becomes expressed through these stories? I mean, is this really who the human, you know, who human beings are? Really, is that what the human race is all about? Is is establishing stories and myths so that we can aspire to something greater? Is that really what this is all about? In many cases, it is, and I and I know that there are. There are scholars out there and intellectual types that will say that in the age of enlightenment or the age of reason going forward now, these myths are, are not needed as much. Uh, you know, a popular atheist writer, Sam Harris, wrote a book called The End of Faith, uh, which was basically trying to create this idea that uh, faith was no longer a, a necessity, you know, like religion is no longer really a necessity in a in a modern society is that we don't really need all these old stories really to cling to. Um, they serve some purpose in, in some way, but we don't really need them uh, in order to actually live our lives out. We can, we can adopt more secular means or more humanist means or whatever they are. We can actually create new ones. And that's a lot of what the postmodern thought is, is that you can just kind of create new ideas. You can create new stories. You can create new things to go against. But that's, to me, where it all comes back around, okay? It all comes back and comes full circle because even if you try to eliminate these old stories, even if you try to eliminate this concept of Cain and Abel and how I would kill my own brother for the right of whatever it was that he was given, it still emerges no matter what you try to do to get rid of it because as human beings, we are all inherently selfish. This is something that is just a, a known fact of life. You want to know how it's a known fact of life? For anyone who's had kids, for anyone who's been around kids, how are your children? They're, they are, uh, they bend default towards me, me, me. I want this. I want that. 
You know, that you can teach them to say please, you can teach them to say thank you and you're welcome, but is that their natural default? Are children naturally very accommodating and generous? Are children naturally very much to the point of, yes, father, I will give you a full 10 hours of sleep tonight because I know you were up with, you know, me all the time the night before? No, no, they're not. They have to be selfish in order to survive. Yes, okay, the, you know, if I'm hungry, I must cry because I can't communicate yet. But even then, as you get older, the body, the flesh, the desire to survive, that comes first. That comes first. And so through growing and through maturation, do we learn to let go of those selfish impulses? Do we learn to let go of selfish desires? That's something that we have to be taught externally. We have to almost like reprogram ourselves so that we don't act out selfishly all the time because it starts at a very young age. So this concept of aspiring for something greater is always going to emerge. It's always going to come out that we need to do something bigger than ourselves is always going to reveal itself in any society that's worth its way, it's, it's worth living in, is you're going to have to have something that you move towards. And those things that you move towards will emerge in storytelling. They're, it will emerge in a storytelling format, whether it's upending a, you know, a political figure, if it's upending uh, a social movement that's bad, if it's if it's going against some sort of uh, you know terrorist group that wants to to overthrow another race of people, there there will be stories that people will cling to to say I want to be part of that because it's something bigger than just me, right? It's something bigger than just myself, and that's how heroes and villains really get made today. Uh, and if you don't think that heroes and villains exist today, just go on social media for a bit. I mean, I'm I'm actually off of Facebook personally. Uh, I made the decision to get rid of all my personal Instagram, Twitter, Facebook handles. I'm, I'm just basically going to be doing uh, professional platform stuff now with uh, with the podcasting and with my blogging and everything else. And that's a whole work in progress right now. So bear with me. <laughs> so bear with me, listener. But the idea that we can just detach ourselves from myths and from heroes and villains and sort of recreate the wheel here is is foolish. It's stupid. Because it's always going to emerge in every generation that comes out. For as long as the human race is around, as long as we live in, a, in the world that we live in today, okay, where, where there are mortal men and women and, and there are resources that need to be allocated and, and worked for or whatever, you're going to have these conflicts. That is reality. Now, does it mean you just let it happen and you don't try to make it better? No, of course not. No, of course not. That, that, would, that would be, uh, you know, copping out, if you will. The reality is that it's always going to surface. It's always going to come up, and you have to be ready to combat it. Um, and that, again, in, in many ways, is, is how uh, a lot of religious ideas have come out. Uh, but even more so, from my own personal faith, why it exists in the first place is because of this problem, this problem of meaning and purpose and what am I supposed to aspire to? Where is, what's my destiny, right? Where am I headed? Uh, we cannot solve these problems alone by just saying, I'm just going to, you know, unveil my psyche. You know, like, what, what does my deep psyche say? Well, my deep psyche says, I want X, Y, Z. And what if I don't get those in my lifetime? Was my life a waste? Uh, did I do things that were good or bad? You know, can I, can I count myself a hero or can I count myself as a villain? So, again, I guess to put this in a, in a neat little bag and, and ship it off to someone, heroes and villains have been around forever. Okay, they've been around for a long, long time. And how we define the hero and the villain really depends upon our worldview. It depends upon what posture we have, what vantage point we're coming from, where we would say, that's an act of a hero to sacrifice on their behalf, or that's the act of a villain who's doing something selfishly. That's the real struggle that we're in today. And like I said before, this is an episode that I probably could even uh, posit on my narrative wars, but I, I felt since it's about storytelling primarily, it was uh, it was best to kind of kick it off here on the writer's lens. So, with that being said, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a pause and a hard stop on this episode. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this this brand new edition of the writer's lens here in 2021. As I said before, stay tuned for more big, exciting happenings and things coming out as the year goes forward. Uh, thanks for sticking with me, all of you who have been faithful listeners over the past year or two, or even beyond that. Uh, my new website will be coming up soon. I will be announcing that on podcasts as we go forward. And, and, and there might be some collaboration going on with some people. Just a, just a, a little bit of a, it wasn't forewarning would be the word because that's, that's not good. Maybe just a little bit of a, a sneak peek. 
Yeah, I'll give a sneak peek later. <laughs> not with this one, but maybe later. So anyway, let's not get ahead of ourselves. So as always, like, share, subscribe, share with a friend, maybe start a conversation over it. Uh, so you can not talk about, you don't have to talk about politics or something. You can maybe talk about some of this stuff, which would be religion. <laughs> so it's the next best thing. But anywho, all right, well, not to belabor this, I hope you guys are having a, a good week, and you're off to a good week, and we will uh, chat with you again soon. I'm JC Alfelto for The Writer's Lens, and I will talk with you guys again soon.